My name is Danny Turner. I was born in New York City in 1947. My family moved here to Michigan uh, about 1954, 55. Uh, and I joined the Army in uh, 1966. Went to the Army School of Photography. When I left the School of Photography, I was sent to Vietnam. I served in Vietnam for a total of 27 months, three consecutive tours. The first was with the 54 Signa Battalion, which was attached to I Corps. And uh, I extended for six months, served six months with 1st and the 9th Cav, part of the 1st Cavalry Division. And then I extended again for nine months and served nine more months in the 1st and the 9th. And uh, left Vietnam sometime in June of uh, 1969. Uh, let's see, my first tour with the uh, 54 signal was. Uh, as a combat photographer, I, uh, uh, my job was as a still photographer. Uh, I did a lot of combat work, but I also did uh, uh, accident reports, uh, damage reports for vehicles, some photography or uh, portrait photography, which I didn't really care for. I mean, my work in the field was, uh, we were just uh, assigned to an infantry unit, and I would work with them for two, three, or four weeks. Uh, uh, in that time period, would usually get assigned to a, 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 uh, an infantry unit. And if we didn't get any good shots there, we were allowed to move ourselves around. Uh, I did a lot of work with the 1st Cavalry Division, the uh, 173rd Airborne, uh, probably the 4th Infantry. I don't remember a lot of them. It's, with years, it just fades away. My first job was with the 1st Cav. Uh, it only lasted a week or two. I think it was just a training run for me with somebody named Red. It's nothing really stood out. We never, you know, even heard a gun fired. It just get me used to being out in the field. And then I kind of developed a partnership with a uh, a man named uh, Marcelo. Ah, oh, I forgot Lafaro. Marcelo Lafaro. He, uh, he's from New York, like me, except he lived there. I'd moved to Michigan, and where I joined the army in Michigan. He, uh, we got along pretty good, real good. So, uh, we we would uh, go like with the first calf. We went with the uh, with an infantry unit, and one would be at the head of a uh, infantry column, and, and the guy would be at. The other guy would be at the other end. Um, we got a. We just worked well together. <laughs> the only time we'd actually see each other would be in the evening when we, uh, you know, we set up our little hooch, and uh, he was a little, uh, he was a little crazy. There was one time he. We were at the one seventy third, and he uh, was taking pictures. Hurt like a, like a, like for a newspaper almost, and he was taking all this information down and writing down and, you know, shooting all these pictures. And I was elbowed him and said, "Mark, he said, we're not supposed to do this." He said, "Well, don't worry about it." And I, he kept going, and I kept nudging him, and finally he took me to the side, and he said that uh, there wasn't any film in the camera, so it didn't matter. I was worried about our film supply, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he, 
he made all these guys happy that they'd never be in their hometown papers. And then uh, a few months later, he got he got killed during the Tet Offensive. He uh, and I went in the field right after that, and I went right back to the same unit, the one seventy third, and I ran into the same people, and they weren't happy because none of their pictures had showed up. So uh, one sergeant just said, "You know, I know you, you little son of a bitch." And I knew what he was after. I just threw up my hands and I said, and, you know, I, I don't know what happened to your stuff. And Mark was handling it. He got killed and uh, I don't know what to tell you. And that seemed to make him accept the fact that the pictures were never going to show up. And it, uh, it, uh, it made my stay there a lot, a lot easier. Um, and we, we went on the same unit we went to take a, it was an engineering survey and we went to take pictures of a, a hillside that the uh, BC and NBA had tunneled into. They used natural caverns and connected them with tunnels. They, uh, the army was supposed to figure out a way to destroy it, but it was, it was so large that uh, they couldn't bomb it without damaging, you know, civilians. So yeah. So we took pictures of it, and uh, I was supposed to go inside, but I got I. We were there with the Korean Army also, and uh, we uh, started to go inside, and I got wedged in a in a little tight area. So uh, I started yelling for help, and and. Uh, the Koreans weren't impressed with me. <laughs> they uh, uh, actually they wanted to kick my ass. They didn't like I, that I broke down and when I got stuck in that cum tunnel. So uh, I didn't go in any farther. I just stayed outside and let them do it. And eventually, their decision was to uh, sprinkle it with powdered tear gas and make it uninhabitable, uninhabitable for the next few years. So I, I bounced around the country a lot like that, uh, that and uh, and back at the photo section and where I did just about everything. I did a little lab work. Uh, I cleaned. I took portraits. I did a few accident surveys, um, and then I'd go back out with an infantry unit, which is. Which was nice because then uh, I was in charge of me. And, uh, me and Mark were just in charge of each other. <laughs> we just had a good time out in the field. It just, uh, I thought I was in combat, but I wasn't. I was just looking. I didn't really experience it. Um, <clears throat> cut it. Uh, well, one of these uh, adventures we went on, Mark and I, we uh, we were attached to the cab, and uh, we had been wandering around for a week or so. We hadn't really seen anything, and we were talking about leaving. And uh, and then uh, we set up for one night, and they told us to uh, take all our packs and put them in a big uh, net they'd brought out. And just keeping up, you know, our load of ammunition and uh, enough uh, food for a day and some water. And they said that they were going to take everything else and deliver it to us the next day when we were done with the mission they had. And we did an air assault on a village. Uh, we went in by Chinooks, landed and formed up outside the village and... The Vietnamese Air Force was uh, strafing it, bombing it, you know, making it a little bit easier for the infantry to get in. And then we uh, we got lined up, and uh, we just uh, started crossing the rice paddies towards the village. 
all the infantry were, you know, firing their weapons from their hips, and I wanted to be able to say someday that I'd fired a gun in combat, so I took out my forty-five and fired one shot, and everybody <laughs> looked at me, so I put it away. <laughs> and we just, <clears throat> when we got in the village, uh, there was no resistance, not in walking in. Uh, there was, uh, there were tanks with us, they were blowing up building or pooches. Uh, I saw somebody come up and said, I've got a picture for you. And it was a, it was a woman with her baby. She'd been killed by the Vietnamese Air Force. And, uh, she'd been hit by 50 caliber ammo and her arm was still around the baby, but her and the arm were a good 10 feet away from the mother. And I just told him I couldn't do that. And I didn't take those kind of pictures. Uh, and we just uh, just kept walking through the village. And we crossed the little road and, uh, and we found them, or they found us, and they opened up on us. And I ended up in a ditch with about a half a dozen infantrymen. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I saw a beautiful picture in front of me, uh, a tank, a couple of infantrymen behind it. And, uh, they were talking on a phone, I guess it hooks up into the, into the tank. And uh, so I kind of got up a little bit and started to take pictures and somebody grabbed me by the shoulder and pulled me down. And he said, do you see that the uh, bushes around us are moving a little bit? And I said, yeah. He said, well, there's no wind. He said, uh, I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and I realized that uh, somebody was shooting at us. So I just laid down and uh, they were there about an hour in the sun. It was hotter than hell. And then... Uh, Somebody put up some cover fire for them and they fell back across the road. But I was afraid to cross the road, so I crawled, crawled the length of the ditch into a bombed out building and, uh, and proceeded to lay in tear gas, <laughs> powdered tear gas, which burns. Um, then it was like lunchtime, it was just like everybody stopped. So I. I went with a bunch of infantrymen and, and I was eating my lunch and there was a, a, a dead NVA soldier by us and, he, and one of the guys objected to it. He said it was, he wanted to move he, or move the body. N nobody else wanted to do it, it was too hot to do anything so he, uh, one of the guys just lit a cigarette and stuck it in the gook's mouth and propped him up and told the other guy to just pretend he's one of us and eat your lunch. Just uh, stuff like that happened all the time in the field, at least for me. Uh, I never saw anybody use drugs, not in the field. A few times in the rear, uh, all these stories about everybody being drug addicts over there. In the field, you, you don't, it's, you, you can't be drunk, you can't be high, you've got to be right there in the moment. You've got to know what you're doing because everybody depends on everybody else. There's nobody else to help you but your friends. No, and no. Uh, when Mark got killed, he, uh, We'd gone on quite a few missions together, and uh, well, the Tet happened, and we were in our, at, we called it Tet City, the Army base at Natrang, uh, and a, a sergeant came up, and and he wanted me to go into town with him, but we'd been ordered to stay in Natrang in our our headquarters, or our company area. He, uh, he was insistent, though, that I was going to go with him, and and I was just as insistent that I was going to do what I was told. 
he finally realized that and gave up and he found my friend Mark and Mark wanted to uh, be a professional photographer, a news photographer and he wanted to make a name for himself so he he told the sergeant that yeah he'd go in town with him <coughs> he, uh, he did he went into town they went into town um, and they were taking pictures of uh, the, the Koreans who were fighting inside the city with against the NVA uh, and they'd stopped by I believe it was the Bath Baptist officers' quarters for in the in the city itself, and uh, it was guarded by MPs, and they were they had a prisoner, and they wanted Mark to take their picture. So he uh, he stepped back a ways. He was using a four by five uh, Graflex, uh, and he uh, he started to uh, you know do the photographs. And uh, and then somebody just uh, stepped around the corner and uh, shot him in the head. He was he was dead before his before his knees hit the ground. Uh, and you know, there's uh, blood everywhere. I I wasn't there, but I mean, his his camera was covered in blood, and um, I'd been told to clean it up. Just, uh, I don't know, I looked kind of shocked, I guess. The sergeant that told me didn't realize that we'd been best friends. So he, uh, he, uh, the lieutenant in charge of our section told him to find somebody else to do the job. I just, uh, <clears throat> after that, things changed. Uh, I wanted out of the unit I was in, and, uh, so I volunteered for the uh, 1st and 9th Cav. Actually, I volunteered for the 1st Cavalry Division. It was a door gunner, and that's where I was assigned. Uh, and I wasn't very welcome, because I, as far as I know, I was the first door gunner in this unit. They'd only been flying with the crew chiefs and no gunners. <coughs> So, first sergeant didn't know. Nobody knew what to do with me. So the uh, first sergeant just put me on KP. He said it, it would. It was something for me to do, and I was out of his hair. And then uh, finally, he decided to send me to the lift platoon. And, uh, and I, I, uh, I had no experience with. Uh, machine guns. Or, I had no experience with anything, you know, in, in this nature. Uh, yeah. Uh, they, they, they told a guy, they gave me a machine gun, they uh, told a guy to uh, show him how to clean it. And, you know, he, he took it apart once and he had me take it apart. And then he, had me take it apart again and make sure it was clean. And, and we went to the ammo point and grabbed a few hundred rounds of ammo and walked outside the wire to where we had like a little firing range. And I fired it and that was it. That was an experienced door gunner. Except for flying it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> things were pretty weird there at first. Uh, Nobody really wanted me because they weren't used to having me. And I didn't fly a whole lot. Not at first, anyway. <clears throat> and, uh, but eventually they, uh, they got used to me and more, more people came in as door gunners. So they were used to us then. And we did a... a up north, we did just about everything. Medevacs, uh, air assaults, rescues. Uh, uh, they attacked a village once. Uh, 
the aircraft I was on was uh, <clears throat> uh, down for maintenance. And, uh, when they went in, uh, they got shot up pretty bad. We lost, I think, uh, five of the Hueys, and two gunships, and two scout ships. And then there were a lot of wounded out there, so they uh, just uh, threw some seats in for the gunner and the crew chief. And, well, we took off, uh, headed out to where all the fighting had been, and it was a strange sight to see all them aircraft sitting on the ground, blades just hanging there, loose. <clears throat> we went in and uh, we started picking up wounded and driving them to a, uh, um, it was a marine hospital in Quang Tree. And we got off our second load and one of my closest friends there was Duffy was there. He'd been, he had been wounded. Uh, he was leaning against the helicopter and he had a, a big uh, two by four bandage on his forehead and no blood everywhere. Just, your head always bleeds. His pants were around the ankle, his ankles, and he had a another two by four covering his crotch, and there was blood everywhere down there too. And I thought, Jesus, man, Duffy just got his balls shot off. We threw him in with a bunch of other guys, and we dropped him off. And we were pretty much done for the day, and we were back in our uh, our bunkers, and nobody heard anything from Duffy. He, we assumed the worst, and uh, <laughs> He came back in well after dark <clears throat> and he had a band-aid on his uh, forehead, a little cut, that bleeds a lot, and uh, he had a, a band-aid on one of his testicles where a, a piece of shrapnel or something had hit him. Uh, he refused a Purple Heart. <laughs> he wouldn't accept the for that. He wasn't hurt at all. It just looked really bad when we landed. Uh, they had so many screwy missions. We uh, when when uh, medevacs couldn't get in because of ground fire, we were called on usually to do it. We get called in to pick up a a wounded man from uh, the Eleventh Armored Cav. They rolled into a village, and uh, they found out that it was uh, had at least an NBA battalion there, and it was uh, what I learned was called a, a rat fuck. Everybody was uh, there was no line; they were just everybody was shooting in different directions at whatever targets they could find. This guy had had been wounded. He'd been shot in the chest, <clears throat> and he was uh, put into an armored vehicle, which was hit by an RPG, and he was born, burned really bad, upper chest, arms, face, and uh, we were going in to get him. He, uh, they kept you know, on the radios, get in, get in, get here. He doesn't have long unless you get here. And we made our, our approach, and uh, I noticed that was, we were receiving uh, uh, receiving ground fire from a, a twelve seven, a twelve point seven millimeter machine gun. Uh, so I got on the radio. It's really my first experience under that kind of fire, and I, I told the pilot, uh, "I think I think we're being shot at, sir." about five o'clock. So he looked back and, uh, and he said, you're right. But they were, they were the rounds were coming about a hundred yards behind us. So somebody must have slapped the guy on the head on the ground there and told him, don't shoot at the target, shoot ahead of it. So he started shooting 
you know, way another hundred yards in front of us, but he started closing on us, so we uh, we left. You know, we, the pilot pulled out. And we tried uh, a couple more times, but every time we tried to come in, they'd drive us out with the with the twelve sevens, and and by this time they were frantic on the ground to get their man out. And the pilot said, "I'll do it one more try," and he says, "When I call for smoke, pop it." And uh, we went out over the Pacific, and we flew about a mile offshore, <clears throat> and then we came in low level, and about 120 knots. And, uh, and when we got over the fighting, he, uh, he just said, you know, give me smoke. And, it, and when it popped, he landed right on top of it. First two men came out. They weren't badly wounded. Uh, they ran out on their own, but they came with the, bad, the badly wounded man. They were, had him on a stretcher, and they got about halfway to us, and they started taking a lot of fire. I don't, I can't understand it, but two of his friends dropped, dropped the stretcher and ran. So uh, I had to jump out and, you know, <clears throat> pick up part of the, you know, the stretcher and uh, help carry it into the aircraft. And uh, by that time, the pilots were, we were starting to receive, you know, RPG fire and small arms fire. <clears throat> so we, uh, we just uh, pulled pitch and got out of there. And this, this guy was in, was in really bad shape. His arms were up in the air. His, his mouth was open like he was screaming, but he couldn't. He couldn't make any noise. No. We uh, we got him to the to the hospital. I don't I don't know if he ever survived. I've had people that they handle cases like that, and they said they they hardly ever do. The, you know, the two bad chest wounds and the burns would would kill them. <clears throat> 